Good afternoon. Uh, this is Jamar Garcia. I am the Vice President of the ICS Alumni Chapter. Thank you for joining us. This is our April Lunch and Learn. Uh, we have a very, uh, very cool format today. We're, we're here with uh, Vijesh Vineet and, uh, and BJ, and we are going to run this kind of like a, a podcast, and, and BJ is going to be the main interviewer. I'm here off camera, but I'm actually here in person. Um, we just wanted to fit the main folks chatting today, so um, um, just shifted the camera over. But basically, we're going to, we're going to learn about their story, uh, talk about business, talk about tech, everything else in between. Um, BJ is going to, uh, to, to be the moderator. Actually, I'll jump in for questions as well. I just wanted to remind folks this is being recorded. Uh, we'll post the recording on icsanteaters.org. Um, if you um, haven't visited icsanteaters.org, that's uh, the main place where we keep up to date uh, on all of our events. We actually have, um, I believe, the uh, ICS um, Hall of Fame, which is coming up next month. So we're going to put that make sure we get that on our calendar and promote that. Uh, and also, um, uh, we might have a uh, capstone um, project presentation in early June that we've been asked to, to kind of participate, at least have a presence there as well. So we'll see who wants to come out and, uh, and join us there as well. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, hand this off to VJ to kick us off. If you have any questions, we should be good with just having folks come off mute and, and yeah, yeah. jump in, right? Also, I'll, I'll be keeping track of chat, and if anyone has anything they want to type in, I'll be sure to, to monitor that. So VJ, if you want to go ahead and right. take us away. Thanks, Jamar. I appreciate it. Um, I've known Puneet and Vijesh for a while, and we all kind of went. Uh, we were all we graduated on the same time, and um, we all kind of went our separate ways. And you know, here we are, all together again. So, <laughs> thank you for joining us today. Um, you. We, you know, I think the first step is just kind of, you know, talk a little about your upbringing, your background, how did you get to where you are today, and maybe just tell us um, who you are and, and what year you graduate, and a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I can I can kick it off. So um, so I'm an immigrant. You know, I, I uh, was born in Africa in Tanzania, um, and then came here when I was very young, eight years old, and um, kind of joined the public school system and made my way all the way through till I got into UCI. Um, and yeah, so UCI I graduated in 2001, um, actually with a biology degree, and ended up doing uh, computer science as well. And oh. so ended up doing quite a bit here, uh, maybe too much. Um, so, <laughs> the two scientists, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's my story. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm first generation in my family, born in uh, the U.S., um, born and raised in California. Um, started my computer career really early. I started coding in like eight years old on Commodore um, back in the day. Um, but you know, I had pressure just like everybody else, sort of going through high school and ended up sort of coming to UCI as a bio major <laughs> and, and a, you know, sort of, you know, ascribed to my parents' desires of me wanting to be a doctor and yeah, give it a shot. And, um, and, you know, through my first year, um, I actually ended up, um, you know, doing my friend's ICS homework for fun um, just because <laughs> I, I liked it so much. Um, and so, um, you know, by the end of the first year, it was sort of a done deal. You know, I needed to switch. And over that, that course of that career at UCI, you know, Vijesh, myself, and a few others, we started a few companies here. We really got into the entrepreneurial spirit, right? It's just, just just messing around with cool stuff, wanting to build cool stuff with technology, seeing what we can launch. Right. And, um, you know, built a good group of friends, um, built a few companies that failed. <laughs> and then and I ended up graduating a, a year late, super senior, uh, 2003. Um, but, uh, you know, I had a good time because, you know, we were around just, just like – Tinkering with stuff and figuring out how to how to build a company. Um, Do you feel like the you know some of the ideas and the entrepreneur spirit you had when you're in college kind of resonates with you, <clears throat> resonates with you today? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we we, um, we you know we had so many different ideas. Um, some of them were were you know desktop based, but we eventually landed in web, right? and we we liked some of the web ideas we had. Um, and they had more scale to them. And this is before, you know, everybody sort of like cracked the World Wide Web wide open, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I had some really good ideas there. And then, you know, 
Actually, the funny thing is, um, we went back to just doing consulting. Went our separate ways and came back. We just came back and started doing consulting, and, um, and then eventually we made our way back to web. You know, like, I'll, I'll tell you, UCI, um, you know, goes very deep in my family. All my two older brothers uh, are UCI graduates. My sister is a UCI graduate. You know, so we're big fans of, of like, the anteater, anteater culture and everything. You know, and initially, you know, I started off in biology, like I said, but when I, like, similar to him, like, it was like, let me try this because I enjoyed computer science and I've been doing it since I was a kid. You know, the funny thing was, you know, computer science, ICS 21 at the time was Professor Clefstad, and we were just talking about this earlier, but we had a rough time, you know, in UCI at the time. I, I don't know what, what exactly, you know, created that environment, but, you know, when you came into ICS 21, the first course, like, only, like, little 5% or so would actually move on, right? And so that, that huge portion of people that actually didn't move on, it was quite a struggle. Right. And so what ended up happening is the friends we did make, like by the time you're in ICS 22 and ICS 23, yeah. there's only a handful of people that, that actually, you know, got through. So, the, the, yeah. so you know, you kind of know those people personally because you're like, how did you do it? You know, like how did yeah, you do it? Yeah, you're sitting in a lab, I know, right? Yeah. Exam, you know? like, so you're, you're like, okay, you know, so, so really what I, 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 whether, whether it was like, you know, purposeful or not, like the environment created uh, people who, who really grinded their way through. Had to. There was, there was so uh, unique, unique experience at the time, you know. But I think it definitely lends itself to some in our career because we we took that mentality of you just have to work hard, and then if you don't pass, you got to go do it again, you know. And, right. and the people people who, who did it and actually grinded their way through, you know, and, and made it happen, actually were like some of the best people I know in my career now. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, my, I can definitely relate with that. So, yeah, I think we've all kind of been there. So, as, as UCI KISIS yeah. grads, yeah. It's, it's been a challenge. Right. It's great. Yeah. Uh, so, can you talk a little bit about um, where you guys are today and um, a little about, I know you've kind of started a few companies over the years. So, I'm going to talk a little about, you know, these companies and um, what your main passions are and what you how, how you plan on growing these companies. Yeah, so, you know, I'll, I'll kind of kick off the founding story, you know, so essentially like Puneet said, you know, we, we started several businesses while we were at UCI, and what we really figured out were, you know, here are some people who didn't want to work for some, wanted to create something on their, they were having fun doing it, right, so initially it was just a way of creating great friendships, and, and we did try a few things, and we failed, and what we realized was, okay, it mattered who was in your team, and so the team kind of shifted to the group that we had, you know, that started easy texting at the end. And so, um, you know, that's one thing we learned really quickly. But along the way, you know, we basically started doing consulting as a first attempt, right? So we, we finished up at UCI. We all kind of went our separate ways. You know, we'd started several businesses that failed already. And at that point, you know, we, we went, you know, Puneet's got a master's at Harvard in computer science. He came back, you know, to L.A. You know, I had, I had gone to USC, and I, I got a master's as well. Um, and so I, I, I was in L.A. at the time, and one of our uh, other partners, Dinesh and Kamneev, you know, he was in L.A. at the time as well. And we got together, and, you know, that, that spirit came back, the same mm -hmm. spirit of entrepreneurship that we had at UCI. And so initially it was just like, hey, we don't want to work for anyone else, so let's figure this out. Let's work for ourselves, right? And so we got some consulting projects. We got some projects at the Navy, you know, doing the air quality management, which I remember Vijay, you yeah. helped, helped with a yeah, little bit. Yeah, and so yeah. Uh, at the yeah. time, you know, we, 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 yeah, we pulled in anybody we knew that, that could put their fingers on a keyboard and, and could make you know, us, you know, develop a business, right? right? And so we started with that and we started some consulting, but very quickly we started realizing people were asking for something very specific, right? They were asking for, hey, we have this, you know, uh, Nortel system or this Avaya PBX system in our office and, and this is how our phone calls work and we don't want to pay for a renewal of the license, right? We want to use this new asterisk, it was open source and we wanted you, you know, install that in our office. We went about doing that. We started installing asterisk and what we ended up doing was learning VoIP. And we learned VoIP very well, and we started to figure out you know, how do we scale this thing. And very quickly, you know, we started realizing that this wasn't for us, right? And this is actually one of the key first first inflection points of pivoting, right? So we were a consulting company. We'd done all sorts of random projects, like I said, air quality management software, housing project at UCI, VoIP stuff for different offices, right? And I just remember this one client um, 
you know, his, his first name was David. I forget his last name now. But, the, you know, he had a live TV ad going out on television, and he had a 100-person call center set up. Oh. And it was, it was our contract, you know. So we, it was like $20,000 contract. It was huge at the time. We were like, wow, we can pay ourselves for a month. Like, you know, like, <laughs> like <laughs> so we're going to be great, you know. So we got this huge contract. You know, we're like, okay, we're sitting in there, you know, like we're crawling under the tables, installing, like, network wire. You know, we had all these servers. We installed Asterisk and all the open source stuff. We tried to figure out how hunt groups work and how do phone calls get routed to people who are not busy and all that kind of stuff. And we were doing this. And I, I just remember the grind. I mean, we were sitting there day and night, not sleeping. There's a live TV ad going out and 100 salespeople walking wow. in, walking in Monday morning. This stuff had to work, right? Like this was, this was the entire business was going to fail if we didn't do our job of it, right? And we just couldn't get it to work. You know, we, we were just, I mean, at, at one point we were taking turns, like, you know, we were so tired. We were just like, you sleep <laughs> while, while, while we do this, you know, yeah. and, then, and then it's like, okay, and then one of us would wake up and be like, you know, like, now my turn to sleep. And like, oh, my goodness. Wow. Like, we would just be taking turns yeah. just to see if it worked. At the end of it, it just didn't work, right? I mean, we just had all these people sitting there. None of the phones were ringing. The live TV ad was on. All of us were exhausted. The boss was just like looking at us, going seriously, like this is, this is what happened. You know? yeah. It was just the whole thing was bad news, right? And, and and at the end of it, you know, it was really what ended up happening was we we came back and you know we were slept for a little bit and we we got up and we we just thought about it and we're like you're like this is not us. You know, that's what we realized. We're like we don't want to be in somebody's office crawling underneath their desk installing their phones. We don't want to be called if two of their phones stop working one day, you know, and we got to go repair that. Somebody has to be on site to repair that. You know, we don't want to do any of this stuff, you know, like a, a little bit of what I did was I, yeah, at USC, I was able to work at the Southern California Earthquake Center and professors would give me like these algorithms for how rocks and sand and water and stuff would move. We would kind of put them into software and run them on supercomputers to simulate them, right, and to see what an earthquake would, would cause the ground, how would it shake, right? And all that stuff was, that was easier. Right, you give me some code and run it on, you know, a few thousand computers. Okay, that's cool. You know, I can do it in a data center, but you know, put put us in a in an office and have us install these like network wires and phones and all this kind of stuff was not us. So really, you know, that was like the first pivot we made. You know, and this this is kind of a story of of pivots. You know, and like at the end of the day, we we really wanted to do something that matched our skill sets, right? And we decided, look, on premise, we just can't do this. I could do do cloud like anything on the cloud, anything that runs on servers on the cloud, mm. that will will handle that we can do, and that was like our core skill set. Yeah, I did my um, my background was web as well, right? So I worked for Microsoft for a little. Are we are we even building anything on prem? My master's was actually distributed databases, so I was really working with Cassandra in the early days and and all that kind of stuff. So we just sort of said, okay, why don't we just stick to what we're good at and, and build a business around what we're good at, right? So um, we we took what we already knew people wanted, which was this phone system. We created, um, created a, a company called uh, callfire.com, right? And um, the well, some of the challenges that we were facing inside of the, the data center or inside of the, the call center when we were going in is we were dealing with other people's carriers and other people's network connections, other people's like, infrastructure. And now we get to build our own infrastructure, create our own relationships with carriers, have our own vetting process for who was a good provider of telephony and who wasn't, right? And so our quality went way up, right? So we were able to produce this like really high quality system that anybody could use on the web instead of having to like around them or a desk right. and attach two wires together. Right? So real so, quick, guys, if you guys can um, speak up a little bit yeah. into the polycom, we're getting, we need to be a little bit louder. Okay, 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 okay. no problem. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of VoIP, and you know, you guys are very sensitive <laughs> to that, right? Just uh, yeah. let's, 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 let's help the technology a little uh, bit with uh, Hasn't come far enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so like we, we just leaned into our strengths, right? Um, and then, you know, we built this business and then, you know, you know, as as you get closer to that customer and the customer's coming in, you know, the business starts to take on its own its own um own world even, right? right. You just right. start to learn about what you're supposed to do. But there's always gonna be challenges. And that that first big lesson of like, hey, you know, we made a huge failure here, we need to learn from it, that just carried us through our career.
moments like that where we'd have a big lesson and then we pivot or we'd shift something around or we'd automate something away from ourselves, right? Because we realized it was an option. But going to like a brand new medium, like you mentioned, and going, you, you're taking your VoIP experiences and bringing them to the web. Um, I mean, I'm assuming there's a lot of challenges and hurdles you have to overcome in terms of everything from policies and regulation to all the way to, you know, understanding, you know, breaking down to different coding modules that you have to, to understand to make sure this happens. And so how did you guys kind of get and overcome some of those, those chasms, for lack of a better word? You know, we, I, we, let, me, let me try to fill in a few of those things, right? So initially speaking, you know, like we said, we went from kind of an on-premise voice over IP company that was doing phone systems, right? And we switched to an SMS company, and we became easytexting.com. There's a, there's a story of how we got there. Yeah, there's definitely, definitely challenges along the way, but the first and foremost was the switch from consulting to, to uh, online, okay. right? And then we, we ended up becoming this online company, right? So that was our first struggle, was just realizing that we're not on-premise people. We're not gonna be able to service an office and, and have staff to do that and handle all of that. So we became this on-premise company, like you said, and we became callfire.com. And callfire.com was basically a company that was designed to democratize communication for small and medium businesses, give them the power that the bigger corporations had that they were able to pay for. And so we, we wanted to do simple things, like why doesn't, have a, why doesn't a small business have IVR so that they can navigate their phone calls effectively like a big business would have? Right? Why can't they do it on their cell phone or something, something like that? You know, why, why does it have to be a physical phone? Right? And so some of these things are the things we kind of piggybacked on. And at the time, you know, we dealt with a lot of difficulties. You know, carriers um, didn't exactly have voice over IP at the time. You know, they expected you to actually buy T1 lines or, you know, DS3 lines mm -hmm. and things with actual bandwidth requirements, right? And we were hunting for people that were not like that. We were hunting for the ones that wanted to do VoIP. We were hunting for the ones that wanted to do everything over TCP IP, sure. right? And and that's that's what we hunted for. And, you know, there were some great partnerships we created at the time, and we built a, a wonderful business out of it, but something magical happened along the way. And I'll let Puneet say it because he, he, he figured this out, you know, internally because we were all kind of staring at it going like, are we in the right business? And this inflection point came up, and, and he'll tell you yeah, how we how we yeah. ran into. So, so around 2000 and <laughs> around 2010, we started to see like so we're running this business, we're sending out all these phone calls. And, you know, we have all these stats on all these phone calls that people are sending out. We have no answer, busy, you know, answered, transferred, whatever whatever the phone call might be, whatever happened on that phone call. What we're seeing was this 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 huge in, huge demand from the market to say, hey, we want answering machine detection as we send these phone calls out. We're like, okay, cool, like let's go build the answering machine detection. And you know, our product team went to work and called up a bunch of people from Caltech and hired them and created the best answering machine detection in the market. Like we did all this stuff. <laughs> and then, you know, like a month after we sort of finished it, we said, oh yeah, we've got the best answering machine detection ever. We, we saw a little bit of inflection upward, but then we were like kind of staring at the numbers. We're like, wait a second. Like, why was everybody asking for answering machine detection? Well, the thing was, is this thing came out. <laughs> and everybody all of a sudden had caller ID and visual voicemail. So you didn't need to answer the phone anymore. So what was happening was all these phone calls were going in the answering machine. We're like, holy shit. Guess what, guys? Voice might still go up a little bit for a few years, but eventually, Right, this thing is going to start to decline. Right, right. We started to look for something else, and we're like, "What's next?" And texting was sort of just a consumer thing, right, back then. And um, we ring didn't, tones. I think ringtones were probably yeah. like the big consumer yeah. thing yeah. at the time. Yeah. Right, you got, right. Your, yeah. you got your ringtones through text messaging, right? Yeah. And so yeah. um, we ended up integrating with a partner, Easy Texting, um, back in '11, and we said, "Okay, well, we're integrating with them." And we'll see what this, this thing is all about. And then we're looking at data, and we're looking at the number of people that pick up a phone call and the number of people that, that click on the text message link, and we're like, holy crap. <laughs> right? Like, this is 80 times better than this, yeah, right? Right. And so what we did was we acquired Easy Texting back in 2012. Oh, okay. And they didn't know what they had. They, they had a good business, you know, doing about $5 million in revenue, like, Pretty solid business, right? But they didn't know how how much scale we were going to get from this thing. What we could see was like this is the evolution of email. This is the evolution of phones. This is the evolution of like 
any communication that you want to do, right, right. it's going to be more effective via text. We didn't know how we'd compete with social media, but um, we didn't know how big social media would be yet either. So around 2016, our bet paid off, right? We sort of kept easy texting around, funded their business, that you know helped them grow. They helped, you know, we we sort of voice still grew pretty fast for the first few years, but then it started to taper, and then SMS around 2016 just started to take off like sure. crazy, and we started like, okay, fine, we've got to dump all of our money in this, right? We started marketing like crazy. We started building more products, more more features, and lo and behold, now millions of companies all over the world are using SMS, right? Because consumers are actually asking for it. Like, we're at the point now where you can't imagine getting a phone call from your pharmacy for your prescription to be ready. That, that'd be ridiculous, right. right? Like, why would you do that? Or, you know, and, and now even, you know, Gen Zers are saying, I don't want to live in a location where I can't, you know, pay by Stripe, pay my, pay my uh, rent bill by Stripe, or I can't pay, or I can't talk to my... Um, my auto dealer via text message to fix my car, or I can't talk to my doctor about my, you know, my ailment via via text message. So, um, so yeah, the, you know, our bet paid off, but we sort of had this great, ball. yeah. But it was all about looking at the data, looking at the business. So we actually have a question, Jeff. You want yeah, to come up, please? Yeah. No, I did. So yeah, I, I'm not understanding. Are you guys a technology company? Are you a consultant? Are you a service provider? What actually yeah, is the sure. business? Right. So here, here's what the business does, right? And so we're we're easytexting.com. We help help small and medium businesses communicate with their customers, right? And there's many ways we approach this, right? We make sure that they have the appropriate uh, phone number in order to communicate with their customers. We help them build their target audience so that they have effective communications, right? And we help them understand the ROI. So usually people have a reason for why they want to text, right? A business will come up and say, you know, we, we, we have an event coming up, you know, it's coming up in December, and we want to have our great communication channel with our customers, right, and all the event attendees and all of that. And so really what we do is provide the platform for communication and communication in mass, right? You, if you're talking to a million people, right, this is the platform you'd be able to use. If you're talking to 50 people, you can still use our platform, right? That flexibility is a key part of our DNA, is that we built the tools and, and features so that people can use SMS messaging, they can use voice messaging, they can use many different mediums in order to communicate with their customers very effectively. And clearly, SMS is like the leader in the space for us, and that's how we pivoted from our voice days all the way to SMS and what we sell to the market right now. Does, does that seem to answer your question? Yeah, let me give you a little bit more clarity. We only talk to about 5% of all of our customers. So 95% of our customers are finding us via the web, coming to our website, signing up, just like a traditional SaaS business, right? And the, the SaaS product is getting them through this, this sort of new marketing medium and, and helping them sort of negotiate with themselves about how much of that medium they're pulling, how much of that comms they're pulling away from email and phone calls and into text messaging. Um, and, and so we don't talk to a lot of our customers. We do help about 5% of them, you know, that are high scale, uh, that have, you know, unique needs, but, you know, about 95% of them don't even need our help at this point. They're just using the software. So, Puneet, what's your competitive advantage? Like, <clears throat> where do you guys provide um, market in, in this space? Well, so, to start off, we're, we're the only self-service brand that you're going to find that helps you get started in less than 15 minutes. Wow. Right? Okay. So, you can literally go from not sending a text to sending a text message in 15 minutes to an entire group of your company, you know, your your staff, your customers, whatever else it might be, right? So we're the only uh, company in the space that can do that today. And it's because we've built a lot of the technology to keep the platform safe, keep, and, and a lot of the, we've worked with a lot of the carriers to create regulations to make sure that consumers are safe receiving those messages. Um, so and that, what, in a nutshell, is our competitive advantage. What's the name of the, the company or the website? Yeah, it's, easytexting.com that you can say e and z the two letters and then texting.com uh, yeah we pasted it on the chat as well right. yeah okay yeah, Are you but, actually you know, people deliver messages by sms right and we actually okay. built the underlying technology and intellectual property underneath it right we're not we're not piggybacking on an api there's actually a lot of sms api players out there uh, but the funny thing is, uh, when you actually dig a little bit deeper into SMS, you realize that there's a lot of regulations. 
and there's a lot of tricky stuff underneath, right? If you have a if you have a 10 digit phone number for your business, let's say you've had this number for the last 30 years, can you use that for texting? Not exactly, but easy texting can help you do that, right? We can take your old phone number and make it text enabled, right? So these are the things we've navigated in the industry to figure out build the intellectual property and help you as a business actually get to your customers the way you want to. Right now, you might have seen those short codes, right? And so those short codes are like, you know, 313131 or 474747, things like that. You might get one of those, right? Or you might see a billboard that says text ice cream to 313131 or something like that, right? And so that's a whole different channel. And that's called short code channels, right? And bigger businesses utilize that for high volume communication. And easy texting has solved that problem as well. We built it into our system. We have a way for, for you to apply for that, make sure you get approved, make sure you're communicating with your customers that way. Um, we also have high speed 10 digit phone numbers. The industry is actually taking a little bit of a shift. So for instance, you know, one of the things I talked about earlier was the idea that you know, we really care about the SMB customer. We really want them to succeed, and we want to democratize this technology for them to utilize in an easy-to-use way, right? And so that's the thesis of, that we hold on to very, very, like, strongly within our business. So how do we do that for these people, right? Because imagine a small business. They don't have the funding to be able to pay for these short codes. They're very expensive. They're like $800 a month, right? And for a small business, they're not willing to pay $800 a month to talk to 50 people, right? That just doesn't make sense. Right? And so we have to find a way to meet them where they are. Right? And so what we've done is we've talked to the industry and we've said, hey, this is not fair. You can't make it so expensive and so prohibitive that only the bigger companies can enter this market. Right? And so we created a scenario for a very long time, which, which was shared short codes, right? which was a great way for us to democratize these short codes and business to consumer communication. And we provide that on our system and allow, allow small businesses to utilize that kind of a short code uh, channel in a much more cost effective way. Right, so the idea is like really, really meeting where your customer need, wants to be met, right? And then over time, we realize, look, shared short codes are, are not ideal for anybody, not even the industry, right? Shared short codes, what that does is it hides maybe multiple businesses behind one number. And that's not easy to clarify for people, right? Like, how do I know who's behind this number? Hard to know with a shared short code. Right, so we, what we thought and what we pushed in the industry very effectively was that every 10-digit phone number should be business enabled. Like why is it held restrictively for personal use? Why can't businesses use 10 digits? If they've had voice numbers that are 10 digits for, for many, many years, why can't they use it for SMS? Right? And that's an open question. And again, we go back to our ethos and culture, and our, our ethos and culture was that we have to help these small businesses get that same technology that bigger businesses have. So we, we push very heavily within the carrier organizations with, with multiple people in, that actually have influence over this. And we said it's very important that 10-digit phone numbers become business class numbers. And we're actually in the middle of a huge industry transition right now where you can have a 10-digit phone number for your personal use, but it has limitations on how fast it can send and how much it can send. Then if you apply with carriers, and we as Easy Texting will actually guide you through that whole process for businesses. Again, we want to make it easy for these small businesses. They have a lot of other challenges and things to work on. We want to solve these problems for them, not really educate them on the industry. We can do that, right? We'll do it for them. And so we help them get these 10-digit phone numbers. We help them apply and make sure that their business is registered and these 10-digit phone numbers can actually send lots of texts. In fact, they can send millions of texts at high volume once we get them through all the checks that we, we want to do, make sure they're safe, make sure they handle it properly. You know, but that ethos really carries through all the way through from you know, our founding days till now. We consistently want people to be you know, able to use our system on their own without needing help. You know, the system has to be very flexible, has to meet them where they are, and be cost effective for their needs. Just to add there, um, Easy Texting is now the largest provider of texting in the country for small to medium business. So, you know, the fact that we're not talking to 95% of that, the, the customer base really helps with scale, right? Because we can we can supply a lot of customers with text messages. And when you say talk, you mean like literally like... Like literally, they do not need to converse with us at all. They don't need to call support. They don't need to call sales. They can get all of the stuff and all of the features that Vijesh is talking about without needing to talk to a person. Gotcha. So small businesses, you guys might know this, um, for those of you in the small business space, they have about 15 minutes free a day. They are too busy running their business 
to set up new technology, to, to try new growth arenas, right? Like they, they have nothing, they have no time, right? And literally they're getting distracted all the time. So what we did was we said, okay, we're, we're going to figure out this problem for them. How do we take that 15 minutes and get them started with something that can actually accelerate their business, which is texting for us, right? So we said, how do we help them get all of this stuff done in 15 minutes? So literally, that's what we created with, wow. with easy texting. And that 15 minutes is, is key because that's that's how much free time they have. As a as a computer science student, and many of the audience, you know, probably think about it. It's like, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean when you're coding, right? Or what does your product team to do when they think about it, right? Like, it's mm. important, right? Yeah. Self serve means that you have to really figure out what does success mean for the customer. Right, that's the root of it, right? And you, we sit down and we always ask, what can we do that makes the customer successful? Because the customer isn't walking in saying, I need, you know, this this phone number with this terminology, you know, and things that we know. They don't know right. this. They, they're, they're, they're like, hey, I have 10 customers and I want to tell them to show up to their appointment tomorrow. Right? Because it's important. You know, I, I, need, I need to make sure they show up. That's what I need. Right, and that's success for the customer. And our goal as a product and an engineering team is to meet them there, right? To get them to a point where they can take that knowledge and understand how our system and how the industry regulations and all that stuff play into it, and make it really easy for them and completely automated all in the UI. So, just from experience, I mean, I, you kind of, you know, what you just said resonated with me because I go through it on a daily basis. So, if you're going after a campaign or a new set of a new market in your small business. Where do you start? Like, how do you guys know where to start with some of these campaigns? Are you guys focused? Do you guys help the, the small business focus and maneuver and figure out what the customer base is that they need to attack to grow their company? Or where can you talk a little bit about what you've seen? So we we take on at, at the at the business we're very horizontal. So we're we're servicing a lot of different customers, right? A lot of different industries. What we've established are jobs to be done, right? You have, you have a few jobs to be done in your business. You want to grow revenue. You want to grow your audience, right, of people that you're talking to. Um, and, and you want to measure, right, how successful you are. So these jobs to be done sort of lay themselves across multiple industries. And then all we do is we give you examples of how customers are, similar customers because we have so much scale, are doing what you want to do within that job to be done. Example, right, you're running a law, law firm, and you want to you want to start communicating with your your um, your cases via text message. Well, here's 30 other law firms using our software doing the exact same thing, and this is how they set it up, right? And so we don't have to get into the, like the advising too much because the network effect of like how big we are now really lends itself to like you know self serve even knowledge based. Yeah, things, that's right? really so, really important. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So you yeah. say jobs to be done. Yeah. Right? <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's something that like triggers something because like, it's a very, it's a very specific phrase. Yeah. So is it, I guess, now, I'm now going through like in my mind like all the, ASIM go horse debut you like if you like <laughs> you know followed all the you know, um, uh, Apple centric kind of or like the Bob Mesta disruptive innovation yeah. all that circle around mm -hmm. jobs to be done and focusing on jobs to be done, how much of that do you follow like a framework for that, or is it like just kind of loosely, loosely follow well, jobs to be done? We have a product marketing team that sort of sits there with the customer and figures this stuff out, right? And, and like we have to, because we're so horizontal, we have to like figure out which one of those jobs to be done actually mm. matters because there's so many different jobs happening on our system. I can you imagine billions of messages a year yeah. going out on all these different jobs. You're like, which one has the most value for the customer? Which one's providing the most ROI? Which one do we have the most scale in? Which 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 one can we acquire the most customers in? So we've got to think through all of this stuff. Yeah. But we have those just just yeah. to kind of tie it back, right? Yeah. Like we, we talked about like how, how do we actually explore that kind of an idea, right? So here's an example, right? We we looked at all the messaging and stuff people were doing yeah. across many different industries. And one thing we found was a lot of people are sending reminders. Texting is great for reminding somebody, but guess what? It really works, right? And and there is some you know these research and stuff we'd read before that too. We we actually worked on a Stanford project where you know text messages were sent out to people to help educate little kids to read before they get get into kindergarten, right? And F is for frog would be the text message, right? And the funny thing is like people, if you just did that, it worked, right? And it turned out like if you just nudge people in certain ways, it works. Right? No, the same thing with the reminders. If you nudge them at the right time and right place, it works. 
right? And so that, that was a very fundamental learning that we had, right? Which is that text messaging is a wonderful for kind of nudging somebody to just knock them over when they're already there. I right, just knock them over. So, for instance, abandoned carts. You know, if, if you have a, a website, you filled a cart, you forgot, you got distracted, you moved on, right? What if you got a text message literally an hour later that just said, hey, you, you forgot this, you know, Nerf, like, you know, volleyball thing that you added to your cart, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, I got to buy that before I go on vacation, you know? Click, click on your phone and you're done, right? Well, guess what? Now, a lot of people probably will say, hey, that was not necessary. I didn't want that, right? Or some people might say, hey, you know, I just forgot and I did. There's a percentage conversion that happens there, right? And, and it's just Probably that, non-trivial, right? Exactly. Like a big... Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just that nudge, right? You yeah. knock somebody over because it was already there. It's just helping them push them over, right? And that was a c critical learning that we had, right? But that's, that's how I look at jobs to be done in general, right? It's like there's, there's some baseline learning that we know text is extremely effective at, which is nudging people mm. and now there's an outcome that the customer wanted which was hey we want to remind people something right we want to remind people to show up to their interview we want to remind people to show up to their appointment right and these these, these are important things that that nudging thing works mm. for us and now we build that into the product right and that's the product that actually has an ROI for customers because now they see it right they see that people showed up to the interview they see that the cart was actually kind of completed at a, at a high percentage rate and that's really where we want to go and some of it goes back to like just the ethos of the company right like it's never a, there's no grand idea you know like if you if you look at the founding story that we we talk about this business like we were a consulting firm we did what we had to do we switched to a voice firm we did what we had to do we switched to an sms firm we did what we had to do and maybe that stems from the fact that we got through ics 21 <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> maybe maybe, maybe that's, yeah. that's where you know we like we're 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 in it for the grind you know we're in it for the grind to see how how we can push it forward All right and, and some of it is you know like as scientists you know we were talking about this earlier is that you know we you know the only thing that really works for us is if it's repeatable right and so we'll test something right but until we can see it repeat over and over we're not really happy. Right, and that's kind of the mentality of the company. Also, is like, okay, so people want to send reminders and they want success in it. Okay, so how do we get there? Right, so let's start by building this, and then we'll watch people, and then we'll iterate over it, and we'll keep doing it. But our goal is the same: is that we really want people to use the nudging capability of SMS to knock people over for success. Right now, we want to figure out how do we do that for reminders? How do we do that for interviews? How do we do that for appointments? How do we do that for events? How do we do it for all these? different markets, and we're going to grind on that, right? We're going to try one thing, and we're going to stop, and we're going to assess it, and we're going to try it again, and we're going to stop it again, until we get that repeated, 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 like, satisfaction of knowing that it is working. Mm -hmm. We will not give up on it, right? That's just the basis of it, right? And that's the whole point of most of our scientific studies, right? It's like, we, we try something, and that looks weird. We should try that again. Let's, let's do it. Now your peers and your, your audience and everybody also tries it. Everybody wants to repeat the, the, the yeah. message of the event and make sure that that's actually true. <laughs> so, for, for, this, for like specifically for that, go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say, have you done this all organically, or did you do outside fundraising? We did raise funding, you know, but you know, honestly, we bootstrapped our company for the first seven years, and so we started CallFire.com, and we were profitable from year one. And because part of it, because we fed our consulting company, you, the money we made off of consulting, we built this product. And then we launched the product, and then we started getting customers. Once we started getting customers, we stopped doing consulting, right? And we ramped up our callfire.com uh, business to a very healthy $7 million business a year in revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And that was all bootstrapped, right? And we were able to do that just within ourselves. And we grew a really nice, healthy business in a time when, you know, when we didn't take dilution at the time or anything like that. And then we realized, hey, the cell phone and the voicemail situation, and we had to pivot. And the only way to pivot was to acquire this company, Easy Texting. And so we ended up doing our first, first uh, investment round. We raised $27 million uh, as our first round, right, um, and with, the, with the goal of acquiring Easy Texting. And, and we changed our name in 2016 to Easy Texting. It turned out to be an excellent acquisition, you know, and also a difficult one. You know, most startups don't start by doing a merger and acquisition, <laughs> right. right? Like, that's, that's hard, you know? Yeah. Like, you're bringing in a whole new ethos. You're bringing a whole new group of people, culture, software, all that kind of stuff. And t talking to computer science, like, you know, we went from a voice channel, which is all real time. You know, somebody's on the call. Decisions have to be made while you're on the call, which means things have to be in memory. You know, information has to be available right away, 
right? And that shifted to texting, which was very asynchronous. But, but right. Jeff, I'll tell you yeah. from the beginning, our business was a cash generator, right? Um, as soon as we went online, the way that we were advertising ourselves on Google, the way that we were working on organic traffic, right, the way that we were leveraging paid media, um, we were just a cash generator, like hand over fist, you know. Uh, and at any time, we could decide to goose and, you know, go to a burn scenario, pull back and get back to cash. Um, and so we did that several times when we had ideas, and some of them didn't pan out. But we always had this really healthy gross margin, um, and, you know, we still hold some of the best gross margin in the industry. So um, that's that's what we've stayed with. So, so bringing it all back, so, I mean, it sounds like there's situations where you're trying new ideas out for different markets. But at the same time, that also has to stick so you actually can grow your business. So how do you, I mean, I know all of us who are computer scientists and we want to do as much research until we find a solution. But how do you know when something will stick versus it's just a hobby? Um, a lot of testing. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, okay. Um, you know, it's all, all, it all goes back to this iterative sort of approach, right? So you, so let's say you build any feature, right? You release it to 10% of of new customers, right? You sort of see what the take rate is, right? You right. see how they're using that product, and you analyze all the data, and you say, okay, are the customers getting a better experience using this new product versus the previous, or the previous offering, right? Because it's all a set of offerings, right? Everything is not just, you know, a microcosm by itself. Right. It's like you're adding, when you're adding something, the whole pie is affected, right? So, so you can't consider it by itself. So you're like, okay, how's a new offering of the new set of features performing versus the old one? Like, are customers getting more benefit out of it? Are they getting more ROI out of it? Are we getting more ARPU out of it? Are we getting more retention out of it? Sure. Right? And then you scale up to 40%, then you scale up to 50%, then you okay. scale up to 60%. And around 60%, sort of the magic will happen. You can sort of go, okay, I like the old business or I like the new business right. more. Right? right. And you really start to feel it because then you get the full scale of the support teams managing it, the dev teams keeping the system live. Right, and your your marketing engine sort of like really cranking and getting people in. Then you're like, okay, now I know whether this is really the thing or not. And if you know you have to scale back to the old version, then you do, right? But you've learned a whole bunch along the way. So right, like, right. Hey, there's pieces of this that we need to use in our next product release. Right, right. especially with SMS is very generic and open ended, but at the yeah. same time you also have to kind of you know dive into a certain market to see if it sticks, and that's yeah. what you want to you know use to grow your company. So yeah, yeah it, it definitely makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, what is it, strong convictions loosely held is what Mark Andreessen or somebody said. Yeah. You know, like that really is a really great way of approaching things. You know, right. which is first of all, don't overcommit, right? And if you if you make a mistake or your idea doesn't work, don't get grumpy or upset over it. Just you know, like okay, it didn't work, move on, right? What's next, right? And and that's really important. You know, I think uh, just always ask yourself what's next is is our internal thing, right? Which is what's next and how can we do it quickly to test it, right? So, okay, so we tested something, it worked really great, okay, take a moment, you know, process that, what's next, right? And you constantly have to ask yourself what's next, because if you don't, you're not iterating, right? And that, that could be a death knell. If you somehow get satisfied with what you have, then it's just not going to work, you're not competing anymore, right? And also, the idea of this iterative development means that you don't have to switch ideas. You don't have to decide that because hey, the market or some other competitor is doing something that they're doing great at doesn't invalidate your idea at all. You know, in fact, if you, if you feel that the pressure of competition is the reason why you shouldn't enter a market, you shouldn't enter the market, you know, <laughs> because that's just the point. The point is the pressure of the market, you know, like that is what we do, right? Like, you know, so that's, that's the whole idea. Yeah, right? yeah to put that on a finer, finer point, is like everybody that's trying to start these companies always wants to come up with a new idea. Mm, right. And one of the things we did with, with, with Call Fire when we first started, was, it wasn't a new idea. <laughs> there was already somebody doing it, right? We were just innovating on that idea. We were just changing a little bit. Like the iPhone isn't the first touchscreen phone, right? Like, but they iterated over Palm. They iterated over what HP had, and they said, okay, well, we can make this better, right? They added the App Store, right? So a lot of people try to think about, like, how they can create something brand new. Sometimes there are things that are already, and it happens every day in our business already today, is, like, there's things at our business that just need a little bit of tweaking, and they'll start to accelerate, right? And just thinking about SMS, yeah. right? Just thinking about yeah. text in general. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? It's sort of like... You know, you kind of look at this progression where it's like, well, there's SMS, and then there's like basically like ways to communicate. Then, then you kind of go past that, and you think, okay, well, 
what's after SMS? Yeah. And like, no, 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 we're not done yet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. So, yeah. Like, kind of to that yeah, point, right. right? It's sort of like, you know, you look at like social media and you look at people like really looking at social media as like, oh, this is the next, next thing. But maybe it's a it's a it's a pivot. It's an iteration around something yeah. that's been there for. But that's a where while. you got to go back to data too, right? Because okay, so social media has a lot of reach, right? But social media, I mean, text messaging is still 16 times more effective from an engagement perspective than social media. You send somebody a social media post versus sending them a text message, you're gonna get way more engagement on your SMS than you are on your social media post. So like, we're not at the stage yet, but we have to be real and wide-eyed about it. Like, okay, fine, there's more scale there, so does it right. matter, right? How do we integrate? When do we need to shift, or when do we need that's to add coming that? down, the pipe down. I mean, the future of SMS is multimedia meets SMS. I think it was RMS yeah. or? Yeah, it's called RCS. RCS, yeah. RCS. yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I hope the industry, you know, improves that aspect of it. I think one of the key areas that SMS can really improve on is delivery, yep. you know, which I think, you know, for, for a while, you know, it's I think it's still an issue, which is, you know, you're still at a point where you'll get to 95%, right, but getting to 96, 97, 98, 99% delivery is hard, really hard, right, whereas there's alternate networks like WhatsApp and things that were built on on the basis that SMS just wasn't reliable enough at that hundred percent. And iMessage and all of those have solved that that end to end like high delivery kind of a problem, right? Which at some point I think the carriers and our industry needs to realize that could be the death knell of SMS, which is that if you can't get to hundred percent at some point, right, then an alternate network will win, right? If it can get to hundred percent first, I would imagine. Like the the device, right, is going to be super important, right? right? I mean, right now it's like I don't even know what what the adoption rate of iPhone is, but you know, you look at iPhones and kind of that's the closest to the consumer, right? So if if there's a shift there, then that could yeah, be this is your identity now. Like there's right. nothing else other than yourself is your identity. Right. Nothing else more closely tied. And your phone number is the UUID, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which actually begs the question, can we have more than one phone number per person? You know, probably makes sense. You know, I think we tie ourselves to one, but in my mind, you know, a business probably needs a number that's the first class citizen that represents them. People need a number that represents them. Perhaps people need a number that represents them when they're doing business, when they're doing social communication. Maybe there, there's a there's a way to kind of like differentiate these things. You know, but the way I see it, I totally agree. The number is, has become of the identity, but now we need more flexibility, and we need to start realizing, hey, you know, businesses need to act that, like that too, just like people are, right? And so if I look at Google and I search for businesses and I look at like 10 numbers, I oftentimes will text them. I'll, I'll hmm. never get a response, <laughs> you know? And that, that to me is just like... You're a, just like looking for a yeah. phone number for Google and texting? Yeah, like and, and as a... <laughs> no, seriously, like as a as a, as a SMS company, you know, like, you know, founder and, you know, currently CEO and, you know, like we're, we're here, you know, thinking, wow, there's a whole business, a whole like group of businesses that have no clue that they need to be on this, right? These are just customers for me. You have right. a new generation <laughs> of folks, they get a phone number, they're not calling it. They're not. No, they're for texting sure. yeah. it first. Yeah. Right? And if the phone number isn't enabled for text, guess what? It goes into the ether and it's it. It's right. gone, right? So <laughs> we're not done on SMS. We're so, not done until your your dog walker and your doctor and your dentist and your lawyer and your you know, everybody's texting you for for communication. Right. I hear you guys talking a lot about social architecture and cultural changes and business ROI. When did you guys stop being engineers? Oh, talk about that transition. No, seriously. Yeah. That's it's, brutal. No, I no, it's, oh. it's actually it's actually a, it's actually a compliment because you've grown beyond just the technology to look at the business. 
but and it's we, an important. We still have pride in being engineers. I guess that's the reaction that you're getting, right? Like <laughs> we are still engineers. I think Vijesh and I still code once in a yeah. while. Um, you know, I just I just wrote a bunch of SQL last last week, right? Yeah. Like I, I mean, yeah, I wrote I wrote some uh, JavaScript uh, last night um, <laughs> just, just to automate a spreadsheet um, that I wanted to do, right? I wrote a little app script from Google, right? So look, I, at the end of the day, like a lot of a lot of tech stuff is we you know we still dabble in it, but. But now we've hired a whole team of engineers and, and all that stuff, you know. But you're right, you know. I think along the way, what we've realized was that our skills in engineering was was just a way to utilize this technology and apply it to a market and create a business, you know. But very quickly, we started realizing that it, that wasn't really the core of, of being a founder, you know. The core of being a founder is like, okay, you you figured out your entrepreneur thing, you figured out you know a business that has a product market fit. And now you've, you've now put things in place, right? And some of these things in place were lessons learned, right? And so uh, to, to answer your question more directly, the way we navigated away from being those, the engineers that cared about, like, the, you know, the raw lines of code and code quality and uh, whether we use tabs or spaces or anything like that, we, we went from that to, you know, hey, should we put code review processes? And we, we developed as managers, Right, and we said, okay, there has to be a good engineering practice, and then we went from managers to business leaders in departments, right? Um, so, uh, to answer your question more, sort of more directly, I think I stopped coding when I found out that there were there were there were people in my business doing it better than me. They were sort of telling me to stop, right? Good. They got okay. to the point where, like we hired these folks, and they're just yeah. like, "Please, just yeah. stop coding. Just stop yeah. it." Right, like uh, let me a, do it. Right? There's a joke. We, uh, yeah. There's a joke uh, one of our engineers sent me. Uh, you know, because I spent a lot of time as a CTO. Right, the, the the life of a CTO starts at number one. I coded everything. All right, and then number two is I wish I could code, and then number two, three is where we're at. Our team won't let us code. <laughs> that, yeah. Right. That means that means we're we're at a point where our team is like, you touch code, you're not going to maintain it. This is bad news for everybody. Right. Just don't. Just stop. You're like, I wrote code the other day, didn't get it checked in. Right. right. Like, yeah, I will say that the, the, the world is facing a big change. Like the, the engineers and the people at the business want leaders that understand what they're doing instead of just being managers. They don't have respect for these folks, and they don't have time for it, and they've got all the opportunities in the world to go work for whoever they want. They want to work for a manager that understands what the hell they're doing. So we do have to stay close to code. We still have to know sort of the basics of what they're doing, right? Otherwise. We're just going to be, not, you know, very high-level managers and motivators, that, and they don't want that. They don't want that today. They have all their own drive and their own motivations. They just want somebody that hears their ideas and says, "Yes, I'm going to invest in that." But there, there are. I mean, I think those engineers are de are depending on the managers to make sure that that product that they're developing sells and it goes out to the masses. Yeah, I hear that. But Huge. like, also like, I, I, you know, I just like over the last year or so, I've heard all of these folks sort of tell me more more rampantly, I don't want to work for somebody that has to explain, like, you know, in particular, I'm talking about a, a BI team. I don't want to work for somebody that has to explain data to. I'm on a, mm. I'm on a business intelligence team. Right. I don't want to explain data to my manager. Like, he should know he's the manager of the data team, right? right? So the, similarly, the same thing is happening in engineering, the same thing is happening in sales, the same thing is happening in marketing. If you don't understand what your team is up to or what what they're dealing with, the problems that they're dealing with, and help them navigate more cleanly and know when, right. like, okay, that's part of the course. Like, okay, this is just a normal problem versus something that's just something we really need to jump on and solve. Create chaos for them. And so you have to understand what's, what's going on in that business. So, Good point. And, so, yeah, sorry, go sorry to jump. I was just going to say, we have, we have five minutes. Okay. 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 Oh. I just wanted to kind of, you know, yeah. make sure that we're – uh, uh, sensitive for other people's time, and you know, like yeah, we like to keep it kind of right there yeah. um, at at, um, at an hour. But yeah, just like maybe kind of closing. I do have one question as far as like advice you might give. It's it's almost graduation season. We yeah. we came in, so we're we're here at the NAC at the uh, New Kirk Alumni Center. We did want to 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 reserve the uh, the den, which is a really cool um, room here, but it's filled with caps and gowns. Yeah. So they're 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 definitely ramping up here for uh, for graduation. So, uh, kind of on that, um, any sort of advice you would give for new graduates or new alumni that are going to come into the ranks? Just pieces of advice. Your team matters most. That's my advice. You got to fill yourself, uh, fill your life with people that that complement you well. 
meaning they fill your gaps, they watch your back. I don't know if you guys n noticed, but Rajesh and I are very different, right? He's very, like, by the book, very, like, meticulous. Well, it's funny because... And I'm super promoter, right? Like, I'm, like, <laughs> out there sort of, like, you know, on the edge of risk, right? So, like, we needed to have each other to push each other, right? Like the right thing so I mean it's it's a key to success when we so started so Vijesh said he wasn't much of a talker yeah <laughs> believe it or not <laughs> <laughs> we got him going we got him going yeah, yeah. All right, well, yeah I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you a few pieces of advice right like and, and I don't think look advice is like a dime a dozen you'll get it everywhere we're not the type of people to obviously take all the advice from right but this is what helped us right number one is appreciate your craft and appreciate the people around you who know their craft you know, like uh, this is this is something that we I talked about with Vijay and Jamar too, right in the beginning, right? It's like, you know, people always say, oh, let's go to a networking event. We'll network. You know, like it's never worked that way for me. What ended up happening was I found people that I were like I was always thought they're really good at what they do. You know, I want to be friends with them, right? And then we're just friends. I don't sit there and say, hey, can you help me with this or can you launch my business with me or anything? Mm, like, it just right. never transpired that way. What ended up happening is I just really respected what they did, and then ten years later. What I found out is like, oh wow, they're they're in this like crazy place in their career because they're good at what they do, and I'm at some place in in my career because you know hopefully I was somewhat decent at what I did, you know, and 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 what ended up happening was that was like the synergy. Is like ten years later, I can talk to Vijay and say, hey, you know, we're both alumni, you know, UCI. Why don't we come back and do a talk to, you know, just just chat and see how things went. And that was the network, right? Mm -hmm. That's the network, right? Yeah. And what it, it was not something you you put into place play was something that developed because you respect one another's craft, right? And I, to me, that, that just means the world because I've met so many people at UCI and people after, and it was never a concerted effort to do networking. But over time, we realized we're both good at, well, same with easy texting. You know, we acquired easy texting, but we didn't start off that way. They were just good at texting. That's all, you know, yeah. and and we started using them as a backend API, and then the day came when Easy Texting's founder said, "Hey, we want to sell," and we were like, "We want to buy," right? Mm -hmm. And and it just happened. That's the network, right? The network happens not because it was purposeful, but it happened because you care about one another's craft. At least for me, that's how most of the connections and people that have helped me over my life have happened. It, there were never never a concerted effort. It was it was people I respected, and all of a sudden we had we had a mutual interest, and it and it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for. I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm like blown away about how much passion you guys have for this area and how much passion you have for this ethos and businesses and this culture and making your craft profound across you know the industry. So, um, you know, thank you and congratulations on the success of your company and it's been it's been a long time coming. So, great job. Yeah, thanks. No. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. This is fun, and you know, obviously, big fans of UCI and the alumni group here. So, uh, hoping that we can grow the audience and everything too. Awesome. Well, Great. thank you so much, and, and thank you for everyone for joining us, and those of you that will uh, watch this video later. Um, if you um, so, actually, a couple things coming up. So, we have this month in April, right? Later on this month, we do have a volunteer fair uh, at at I think it's here at the NAC. So uh, keep an eye out on, on email uh, for any announcements or, or uh, you know, the Slack channel. But, you know, we're looking for volunteers if you're interested in, um, in joining uh, leadership with the chapter. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, planning on uh, creating uh, a lot more, not just content like this or experiences like this, but also networking, um, uh, mentorship, education, social events. And so we're really trying to um, put a groundwork to, to get those things going. So um, if any of you are interested, um, feel free to uh, – we have our emails on icsanteaters.org, so feel free to um, email us there or, um, you know, join the Slack where we're going to try to um, uh, uh, try to use more actively to communicate. So um, I think of that, any, any parting words, or I think, I think we're – Good to go, yeah. yeah. We're good, yeah. yeah. All right, thank, thank you, you for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, well, thank you. Yeah. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> dot, dot. <Okay. laughs> thank you for joining, everyone. Thank you. All right, thanks.